And welcome to Expedition Church Wednesday night. Yes, virtual. Uh, there's there's uh, been tornadoes in the area, and we are uh, there's another line coming through in uh, the next hour or so, and we just thought it's best that people not be out on the road uh, in this weather. So, um, as much as I hate to be virtual instead of at the building and having people there, we just thought it's in the best interest of everyone to be virtual tonight. So. Um, Welcome to Expedition Church Online Only tonight. Hallelujah. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in. And um, we are in the present day ministry of Jesus. And as we talked about last week, <clears throat> you know, Jesus, when he sat down at the right hand of the Father, did not cease from ministry. He has an ongoing ministry. It is not his earthly ministry. As a matter of fact, we are carrying out the earthly ministry of Christ in the earth. But he did sit down to become our high priest. Praise the Lord. And um, he also became our mediator. And so then tonight we're going to cover the last two things in this present day ministry. Answer the questions from the lesson and we'll be done. It may not be a very, very long since it's a partial lesson. And, um, you know, it's, it's, we go quicker when we do the virtual service for some reason. It's, uh, less interaction and stuff. So, anyway, um, Jesus, our high priest, carried his own blood into the Holy of Holies and satisfied the claims of justice that were against us. As our mediator, he introduces unsaved man to God. And remember, Jesus is the only way to God. No one can approach God except through him. Uh, as soon as man accepts the rec reconciliation work of Christ, he becomes a child of God. And then Christ become, begins his intercessory work for him. Jesus is the intermediary. Inter, oh, intermediary oh, blah. Sorry, Jesus is the mediator Woo! Um, for the sinner. He is the intercessor for the Christian. The first question that comes uh, with this is, what does a child of God need someone to intercede for them. And, and um, he is our intercessor. <clears throat> Romans 12, 2 says, but be, uh, be not fashioned according to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. At the new birth, our spirits receive the life of God. We're born again. We pass from death unto life. Uh, however, the next level that our minds uh, need and that we need in our lives is for our minds to be renewed. <clears throat> for the number of years that existed before we were born again, we walked according to Satan. He ruled our minds. That Hagen used to say, uh, even right up until uh, he went home to the Lord, that the greatest single need of the church today is minds renewed to the word of God. Minds renewed to the word of God. Um, and so, because Satan had ruled our minds and our minds were uh, operating according to the darkness of this world, um, we need to have them renewed and transformed and changed. Now that our spirits have received the life of God, our minds need to be renewed so that we can know the privileges and responsibilities as children of God. So when you get born again, you don't know. When I mean, you're born again, you know you're saved. Feel good. You're excited. But then, you know, there's all kinds of, uh, of ideas about who you are as a Christian. Well, we're sinners saved by grace. You know, we're just worms on the stand on the ground. One day in the sweet by and by, when we all get together, hallelujah. Uh, we even want to know if the circle's going to be unbroken. Hallelujah. And, uh, you know, we're standing on Jordan's stormy banks looking over into Canaan land. And a lot of these songs, thoughts, uh, churchy statements that are made are biblically inaccurate in regards to who you are as a New Testament believer, as a born-again believer on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the only way to find out um, what it has come to pass and what it means and um, 
what has transpired in your life when you got saved, became a Christian, is to have your mind renewed to the Word of God. Now, that's where revelation comes. That's where understanding comes. That's where we find out who we are. Amen? Glory to God. So now that our spirits have received the life of God, our minds um, must be renewed to know what our rights and privileges are. Scripture shows us the need of the renewed mind. Look over in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Looking down in verse 22 of Ephesians 4. And it says that you put off concerning the former conversation. Now, conversation is an old English word that means manner of life or lifestyle, how, how you conduct yourself. Um, the old man put off the former conversation. The old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, and true holiness. So you're created in righteousness and true holiness, but your spirit of your mind doesn't know that, doesn't understand that. And uh, if you do not renew your mind to the word of God, you will continue to not know what it means to be born again. You'll walk around with all these, like I said, churchy sayings and um, uh, demeaning, you know, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Yet the Bible calls you an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. I'm a sinner saved by grace. The Bible calls you a saint. Hello? You were a sinner. You were saved by grace through faith. That now yourselves is the gift of God. Hello? But John, we went on and, and with it was such a, um, a, a an, an emphatic statement. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. He didn't say sinners saved by grace. And so without the word of God and renewing our mind to that, we do not get to come into the understanding or the revelation of what has really taken place in us. And so um, praise God. It's growth, uh, it's growth, that is the renewing of the mind, is determined by our study and meditation of the word. During this period of mind renewal, uh, we need the intercession of Christ. Many times we strain our fellowship with the Father as in our ignorance of his will. And we will, many times we say and do things that are not pleasing to him. Then again, we need his intercession because demonical persecution is against us. And blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Um, this isn't the persecution of men, but the persecution of demons. Scripture refers to the persecution that we receive from men in John um, 5, through, 5, 10 through 11. Let's look at it here. John 5. I, I'm saying John. Matthew 5. Matthew 5. I'm trying to stop Matthew 10. Matthew 5, 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, demonic forces railing against you, coming against you. Verse 11 starts with this. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. And so persecuted they the prophets, which were before you. Praise the Lord. Not that we're getting persecuted, you're, but you're going to be persecuted. Okay? So we need, we need the intercessory work of Jesus. And let me say something. Jesus don't pray no wimpy prayer. That was a double negative, wasn't it? Okay? So Jesus doesn't pray any wimpy prayers. Okay? They're not, oh, Father, if you, 
if you could, oh my, if some, if there was a somehow in some way you could do something for Cap. I mean, I don't know what you can do for him. Uh, he's just, he's just such a mess. But you know, if you could find in your great and infinite wisdom to come up with a plan to, to get him out of the mess he's got himself into again, uh, it would be appreciated. Uh, in, in my name, I pray. Amen. That's not how Jesus prays. Okay, aren't you glad, Cap? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, with those kind of prayers, who wants to be praying for him? You know, um, no. He intercedes for us according to the will of God. He makes intercession for us according to the will of God. Remember, in Romans chapter 8, it says, when the Spirit takes hold with us together against our infirmities, we may not know how to pray as we ought. Hallelujah. But the Spirit prayeth, hallelujah, according to the will of God. He prays according to the will of God. Intercession is being made according to the will of the Father. Well, he loved us so much, he gave Jesus to uh, redeem us. The, the who's who believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And how shall he spare not his own son? Now also with him freely give us all things that pertain to uh, a life and godliness. So the prayer life of Jesus is in his intercessory prayer life is praying for the plan and purposes of God to be brought out in your life. Not that he put cancer on you to uh, and break a couple of legs to make sure that you understand he's serious about you not doing something. Hello. We can get so foolish. Uh, and, see, and really, people who do that have help. They have help from an unrenewed mind that is still governed by the laws of darkness, of the kingdom of darkness that's still operating in them because they didn't renew their mind and get rid of it. Thank you for your enthusiasm. In addition, demons persecute us for righteousness' sake. They hate and fear us because God has declared us righteous. And, in many, and most of that, you know, Jesus intercedes for us because we haven't fully learned our authority. And it can cause us to stumble. Regardless of this, he's able to save us to the uttermost because he ever lives to make intercession for us. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. <clears throat> I'm sorry, my throat, throat feels a little, it was a little froggy Saturday night. They had our um, classroom cold enough today to hang meat and um, couldn't get it turned off. I had a coat and a heater on and it was 70 degrees outside, but in our classroom, I'm telling you, it was like a meat locker and that was the meat in there. I had to check, make sure I didn't have a hook on the back of my what hook hung up on the hanger. Okay. Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore, he's able to also save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing or because he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Aren't you glad Jesus is living to make intercession for you? No one can lay anything to the charge of God's elect. God has declared the believer righteous. There is no one to condemn you Jesus is living to make intercession for you. In Romans 8, 33. Hallelujah. Isn't it good to be alive in Jesus? Yes, amen. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 33. Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. And who is he uh, that condemneth? It's Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even risen at the right hand, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So look, he's the one that make, could, could condemn you in times of failure and sin, but he's interceding for you. Hallelujah. I said he's interceding for you. And the next verse gives us a very deep, deep, deep insight with very easy to be understood statement into the plan of God, the heart of God. He ever lived to make intercession for us. Next verse. And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine 
or nakedness or peril or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, in Paul's doxology to this passage, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor debt, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He makes intercession for us because he loves us. His plan and his design is that we make it victoriously. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So he is our um, high priest. He's the mediator. He's our intercessor. And now last, he's our advocate. We came to the Father through Jesus, our mediator. As sinners, he, he mediated the plan of redemption as we received him. Glory to God. We felt the sweet influences of his intercession on our behalf. Now we want to know him as our advocate before the Father. How many Christians today, hallelujah, who are living in broken fellowship with God? And that usually happens because people don't know the character of the Father and the plan of redemption, provisions for reconciliation. Um, would be living victorious lives in Christ if they had known or knew that Jesus was their advocate. Um, another word we can use for advocate is lawyer. He argues our case. He is the, the devil doesn't get to argue our case. Jesus does. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. Jesus is the lawyer for the saints. He hasn't lost any cases. Hello? Every Satan gets to go, oh, he's advocating it. He's their lawyer. Oh, I, we're in trouble again. Because he loses every time. Hallelujah. Um, because of our unrenewed minds and satanic persecution, we sometimes sin and cause fellowship to be broken. We don't lose our salvation. The fellowship is broken. Every child of God who breaks fellowship with the Father goes under condemnation. If he had no advocate, he would be in a sad position. Let me say this. The primary source of that condemnation is self-condemnation. John says something very interesting. If our heart condemn us not, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. He didn't say if the Father condemns you not. He says if our heart condemns us not. We have confidence toward God. <clears throat> when you fall into sin, fellowship is broken between you and the Father. Well, you're under grace, you're already forgiven. That's not the point. Whether it is pre-forgiven or not pre-forgiven or post-forgiven, you might be pre-forgiven, mid-forgiven, post-forgiven. Just like some people are pre-mid and post-trip. The fact of the matter is that if you go enter into sin, your fellowship is broken because your own heart will condemn you. We get to try to get people to uh, get their heart so that it doesn't have a sense that fellowship has been broken because of sin. So they just keep right on going and living however they want to live. No, that is there to cause you to recognize that was the wrong step, that was the wrong path, that is a wrong way but we have an advocate. We have an advocate. Glory to God. Um, the word shows us that if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. 1 John 3, 2, 1. My little children, these things write we unto, uh, write we unto you, or write I unto you, that ye may not sin. And if we sin, so that I, um, I'm sorry, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Hallelujah. 1 John 1, 3 through 9 is God's method of maintaining fellowship with him. If we sin so that our fellowship is broken, we may renew that fellowship by confessing our sin. Now, confessing sin doesn't get you born again again. 
is an acknowledgement that you recognize the action was wrong. Are you here? And that you want to be in restored fellowship with the Father because you did it wrong. You confessed that what you did was wrong. Um, a forgiveness is applied. Okay. And there's a lot of argument. There's a lot of argument about First John um, one nine now. But the bottom line is this. You know it, I know it, everybody on the planet knows it, that if you sin, your heart will condemn you and you need to get that straight because it interferes with your walk with God. Primarily from your side. Hello. When Adam committed, I even committed high trees in the garden, God came down looking for him. So God's not rejecting us when we sin. He's bidding us to come. On the other hand, you don't want to become so calloused by being pre-forgiven that you just go out and sin and don't bother you. It's okay. I'm pre-forgiven. That's bogus. I said, that's just pure bogus. It's not biblical. Well, if you're under grace, you won't sin. That's not what the Bible says. Are you here? I mean, if that were true, we could take out a whole bunch of the New Testament. We didn't need it. We would just say, get born again, we'll see you in heaven. End of story. Wouldn't need Paul's revelation. Wouldn't need the rest of the scripture. Just keep loving Jesus and everything's going to be great because you're pre-forgiven, pre-blessed, pre-prosperous, pre-healed. Uh, it's all yours. You're automatically going to have it just because you're saved and going about your life then we wouldn't need an advocate. We wouldn't need anyone arguing on our behalf. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I can feel it coming through the screen. Okay? Jesus' ministry as an advocate is the work of Jesus on the part of God the Father. However, he is able to act as our, uh, unable to act as our advocate unless we confess our sin. We go before him, say, I acknowledge what I did was wrong. He goes before the Father and says, they're under, they're under the blood. And, it's, and here's what happens. It's not the action that gets cleansed as much as the conscience of it. That the blood of bulls and of goats and, and uh, sprinkling of the ashes of the heifer, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more? Shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, who offered himself to God without, without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. His blood purges our conscience. And self-condemnation is erased. And now we have confidence before God. And we can know that he hears us because our heart condemns us not. Hallelujah. He takes your case to the Father and pleads it on the basis of his blood. The word declares that when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God can forgive our sins and be perfectly righteous in doing so because Christ bore them. He's faithful and ready at the moment we confess to wipe them out as though they had ever been. It is absolutely essential that we know Jesus as our advocate. Many who are out of fellowship and confess their sins many times without receiving that sense of restoration or the purging of the conscience because they did not know Jesus was their advocate. They did not take forgiveness when they confessed sins. They did not act upon the word which declares the Father forgives the moment we confess. No Christian should ever remain in broken fellowship any longer than it takes to ask forgiveness. When the father forgives, he forgets. A child of his should never dishonor him by ever thinking of your sins again once the advocate has dealt with it. And last but not least, Jesus is our surety. He is our personal surety. He is the most vital, of, this is the most vital of all ministries of Jesus at the father's right hand. Under the law, the high priest was the surety of the old covenant. If the high priest fell, 
it was interrupted the fellowship between God and Israel. The blood of the atonement lost its efficacy. Under the new covenant, Jesus is the high priest and surety of the new covenant. By so much more, by so much also hath Jesus become the surety of the better covenant, Hebrews 7, 22. Our position before the Father is absolutely secure. We know that throughout our lifetime, we, may, we have at the right hand of God a man who is there for us. He is preparing us before the Father. He always has a standing. We have one representing us before the Father. And our position is secure. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, let's go over our questions from, that were covered for last week and this week. Like I said, it might be shorter tonight because we don't have, um, we're not there in person. We're doing half a lesson because we got, um, took us longer last week in person to do the half, the first half. Um, but what are the three views of Jesus' ministry? <coughs> and they were that Jesus beyond the cross is a lowly man of sorrows. Um, the other was Jesus on the cross as a son made sin. And then the third, Jesus seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, the exalted one with a name above every name. Hallelujah. He is seated at the right hand of the Father with a name that is above every name. Um, how does the high priest of the old co covenant uh, exemplify a type of Jesus, the high priest of the new. Once every year under the old covenant, the high priest entered into the tabernacle on earth with the blood of bulls and goats to make a yearly atonement for the sins of Israel. Typology of the coming Christ. Jesus entered into heaven itself with his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption, not atonement, not a covering, but a purchasing for us. What did the acceptance of Christ's blood by the Father signify? It signified that the claims of justice had been met, that man could legally be taken from Satan's authority and restored to fellowship with God himself. Glory to God. Hallelujah. What are the two main reasons for Christ being man's mediator? He's the mediator because what he is and what he has done. Hallelujah. Number five, why does a child of God need an intercessor? Well, although the uh, new birth is instant, our minds are not renewed. Therefore, we need intercession during the process. And secondly, because demonic persecution against us. We need him praying for us, praying to sustain us and uphold us and keep us by the right hand of his power. Now, in Matthew 5, 10 through 12, what are the two types of persecution mentioned? And they are persecution of demons and persecution of demons. From men. Uh, number seven, when does Christ act as our advocate? Um, because of our unrenewed minds and satanic persecution, we do sometimes sin and cause our fellowship to be broken. Every child of God who breaks fellowship with the Father goes under condemnation. And what do we say? Primarily self condemnation. Why is it essential for every Christian to know that Jesus is as an advocate? Even though we, we may ask, even though we may ask for forgiveness, when fellowship is broken without his advocacy, we do not know how to receive the restoration offered to us. And why and what does Jesus as the surety of the covenant mean to you or to me? Um, and my answer was this that my position before the Father is secure in Christ. I do not have to attempt to secure myself. He is my surety and glory to God. And the five phases of Jesus's present ministry and a scripture for each. Jesus, my high priest, Hebrews 8, 2. Jesus, my mediator, 
1 Timothy 2, 5. Jesus, my intercessor, Romans 8, 33 through 34. Jesus, the advocate, 1 John 2, 1. And Jesus, my surety, Hebrews 7, 22. <clears throat> Praise God. Um, we're going to finish early tonight. And uh, the next week we get into healing. Praise the Lord. And uh, thank you. I appreciate y'all joining us. I know uh, I, I would rather be at the church been in person, but with all these storms and all that stuff going on, we just feel like it was safer for everybody to stay home and uh, not be out on the roads. And um, you know, join us on Sunday. Praise the Lord. Um, we still haven't heard. There's still things out there taking place. Haven't heard about our doors. Haven't heard from Duke Power. Um, we're waiting on these things with, with great anticipation. Praise God. We look forward to all that being done and um, reaching the laws and building the kingdom and doing great things for Jesus because he, the greater one's in us. Hallelujah. Um, at this time, we're going to receive our wins tonight, uh, time of an offering, electronically only, obviously. Uh, if you give through um, Cash App or PayPal, you can go ahead and um, get your offering ready to send it. Praise God. And uh, remember these words that Jesus spoke, give and it shall be given unto you good measure. Press down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. Praise God forevermore. Father, we pray over people as they give and tithe and sow into the kingdom of God. We thank you that you open up heaven's windows and empty out on people blessings they do not have room enough to receive. That the devourer is rebuked for their sake. There are lights of, the lights of land and lend to many and don't borrow in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. We sure love you here at Expedition Church. I appreciate all of you. Thank you for joining us and being a part of the service. Uh, until we meet again, remember these words from uh, the first epistle of John, chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Remember uh, to tune in each day on the church website or the church uh, Facebook page and get in on 31 days of uh, to radically change your prayer life. They're popping up on Facebook every day. Get a hold of that. It's about a minute and a half to two minutes. Um, I think, are they, are they or even that long? A minute and a half, two minutes? They're all under three minutes. They're all under three minutes. Hallelujah. And you can uh, watch those. Share them, share them on your Facebook page. Share them with friends. Praise God. Till we meet again, we love you. God bless you. See you next time. Here. At faith, at, at, um, <laughs> at, at, at this place of faith, at this place of victory, at this place of walking with God, this place called Expedition Church of the Triad. We'll see you next time. Love you. Good night.